Hello, beautiful people. This is your host of Icon Conversations, Asa Laveau. I am enthralled, excited, um, enthusiastic about being in front of you today. If you are not aware of what in the world Icon Conversations is, if you're like Asa, yeah, I'm just here because I got an invite or maybe I already know you as a person. What is this? So Icon Conversation, the entire point is to for you to meet people who are becoming or on the road to iconic things within their industry. So whatever industry that may be, and if that may be you, I'd love to talk to you as well. So you may be an icon in the e-commerce space. You may be an icon in the professional development space. You may even be an icon in the janitorial space. And guess what? Someone needs to hear your story. Someone is definitely waiting on you to say yes to coming to Icon Conversations. For those of you who have no idea about who I am, again, my name is Asa Laveau, and I promise don't let those three little words, those three little letters mess you up. It's not Asa, it's not Asa, it's not Asia. It's, I promise you, it is none of those things. I, I, I'm here, I've been, I've been having this name for almost 40 years now, and I promise you, it is none of those things. It is Asa <laughs> Laveau, and me being Ace Lebeau, what I do is I catapult audacious entrepreneurs towards their next million by providing iconic bankable deliverables, a lot of times starting with business automations. Now, how do I do that? I do that through my concierge agency called House of Icons. So shout out to Icon Nation out there, to all the money cousins in the room. And without further ado, Let's just get into it because we have someone today that I am, what's the best word to say how I'm feeling about this? Because this person's all about words. So let's pick a word that means something <laughs> because words mean things. That's important to remember people, ladies, gentlemen, humans of the world. Words mean things. So how I'm feeling right now about this human would be, hmm, I am feeling, hmm, delighted. I am feeling delighted that this human has said yes to human coming on to Icon Conversations. And if you know anything by now, I don't do this whole thing about their bio. Their bio is in the show notes. I don't do that. I let you get to know them in the most chilled and organic way through our time together, through this episode that all three of us are co-creating right now. So without further ado, hello, Heather. How, how are you this moment? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. And I'm just going to apologize now. We are having 80 degree days in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So windows are open and people are acting a fool out on the street <laughs> as fast as they can with their motorcycles, dirt bikes, and ATVs. So I'm just letting everybody know it could get loud. It's completely okay. So if you are, if, so you, you all just heard Heather say that. So if you <laughs> heard her say that, I am saying since you, she gave you context, provide grace and space for this episode. I say again, provide mm -hmm. great space for the episode. Um, because I don't believe in perfection. Like we're just, we're here and we're gonna get it done. Point blank and period. So yep. my very first question to you, Heather, <clears throat> before we get into it, into it, I would love to know, what does being iconic mean to you? I think it means, it, it doesn't necessarily come from external um, recognition. I think it, it tends to be when you know that you are singularly great at what you do and you know that you have, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You know singularly that you are great at what you do, but you feel called to service to provide what you do to others. And I align, believe, agree 
with that definition for sure. So there are some individuals that may not know truly who you are and what you do. So what field of business are you iconic in? I am a book editor for authors of children's books and adult nonfiction. Okay. Being so, for those of you who may not know, I'm working on book number seven right now. That's we're actually like well, right a phenomenal now. cover, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, been, she has been privy to the cover. Um, I did let her see that before coming on. And so I understand the what an editor can do to a story. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times when you're writing a book, most times when you're writing a book, you are head down in the weeds. You're just doing your best not to faint in the process, (laughs) to believe in yourself in the Mm -hmm. process, especially the first time around. Yeah. And you are just, you know, making sure that the words come out and they get on the page. Like Mm -hmm. we just make sure they get on the page. But in my experience, an editor is someone who makes the page magical, that makes the page come to life, that makes the page clear, Mm -hmm. absolutely clear. Because it is a shame when authors do all this this promotion around books and they have absolutely nothing tangible to read that makes sense. It's not concise, Um, (laughs) it's not clear. You feel like you are listening to Cookie Monster (laughs) while you are reading the book. I'm like, why did they not get anyone to edit this? Yeah. What has been your experience editing? So I think that, um, I think what people need to understand is that when you are writing a book and publishing it, um, editing is both the most important and the most expensive step in your process. And the reason why it's so important is because, um, you know, when you spend your money on anything, right, you buy a car, a chair for your dining room, a blender for your weekend margaritas, whatever, right? I mean, maybe that's just me. Um, But when you buy anything, you expect the very best for your money, correct? Right. Why is it different for books? Why would you be okay delivering something that is less as less than as perfect as you can make it to your end user, who is your reader, who is your consumer, right? A lot of people don't think about books in that way. They just are like, oh, I want to write a book. I want to be published. And they think it's like not a big deal. But writing a book and publishing it, self-publishing has opened up the world. Thank God the gatekeepers are gone. Um, I mean, they're still there a little, but they matter less. Um, but it has also uh, unleashed, and I know that's a strong word, it has unleashed a bunch of books who ha- that have not been professionally edited. And I would question, when you get material from someone, if you're going to do business with them, do you trust them if there's a ton of errors in their note, their email, their text? I mean, text much is a little different, but you know what I'm saying, right? Um, And so books work the same way, especially for people uh, like you or a lot of the other authors I've worked with and and am working with who are using their book as a marketing tool to leverage their business or to leverage for their business rather, right? So if you, if you, if I take your latest book, let's just call it Asa's Awesome, right? Right. So we open the book. And I'm reading it and it's rife with errors. I'm not going to think you're very awesome, right? Like I'm going to be like, what the hell is this? So uh, editing is that important. It does protect your brand reputation. Um, And there's a lot of different kinds of editing out there, proofreading, copy editing, blah, 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 right? Um, So you really just need it. Honestly, proofreading is just I's dotted, T's crossed. Um, But what I do is I come at your, I will look at your book in, from two different lenses, the rules, right? We're going to talk about, you know, grammar and punctuation, spelling, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, but I also come at it because I'm a reader. I read probably 40 books a year, easy, maybe more. Uh, okay. 
No, you, okay. Think, yeah, I read. <laughs> and I, uh, you should see the stack of books next to my bed. It is embarrassingly tall. Um, and I have books like, that need bookshelves. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but I read a lot. I read to, I read to my kids growing up. I read to my grandkids and I read. So coming at it from the direction of a reader, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to leave comments and I'm going to make suggestions because my job is to pull the very best out of you. And sometimes you like, I've had people like, do I really have to answer this question? I'm like, uh, yeah, you do. Like, that's the whole point, right? So it's really just about making sure that we are working as a partnership to produce the very best book that's humanly possible. And I say humanly possible because humans are not perfect, okay? President Obama's book had errors. Mrs. Obama's book had errors. It's just what it is. And that's, I'm very glad that you brought that up. The fact that there are very well, very well written, very mm -hmm. well marketed, very yep. well read books that exist into the world that are most definitely uh, possessing errors, but that doesn't mean the book is now trash. And it no, doesn't have to mean like, that you're really, now trash. It's like one error every 25 pages, right? Every 50 pages. It's not like it was rife with errors. It's just, you know, when you're reading it, you know, forever float us. I had to clutch my non-existent pearls. I said, oh, there's, there's an error in here, but I was like, okay, but humans, right? We're right. human. And so it, it is about producing the very best book that we can together as a partnership so that your end user is taken on the journey that you intended them to take. Correct. And that's key. Now, some authors, I've, I've, yeah, because I've been around authors for quite some time. Some authors don't truly understand that part about taking them on a journey. Mm -hmm. Like truly taking them from this place to this place. Mm -hmm. What would be something that authors can consider mm -hmm. when they are creating that outline to ensure their reader goes from here to here. So I think you need to start with the end. So start what's the, what's, what's your end goal? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? How do you want them to think, right? Like what's your end goal? And then how are you going to get them there? So it's, you know, it's like reverse engineering almost. But a lot of people get like super duper hung up about an outline. Like they freak out at outline. Oh my God, I can't do an outline. And I, I always equate it to, if you have ever, have you ever put together an agenda for a meeting? Almost everyone says, well, of course I have. I'm like, that's an outline. Mm -hmm. Your outline is a map, but it is a living, breathing document. It is not set in stone that it can never be changed, right? You may have chapter two. Chapter two is really chapter six and six is three. Like, you know, it might have to move around a little bit. That just happens. Um, but for the most part, if you start at the end and you understand that you're taking them on a journey, you need to make sure that your point A to Z all those dots connect. And that is another job for your editor. And that is why another reason why you need one. Most definitely. And yeah. we're talking about the journey of the book that authors are, you know, following and hopefully putting together for their readers. But I am going to use this to segue into your journey. So how did okay. you, Heather, Get into like how does because I've never heard a little person say I want to be an editor when I grow up. I've never <laughs> heard that in my life. Like I've never yeah. seen a little four year old little kid be like, yeah, I want to be an editor when I grow up. <laughs> They're like, wait, you want to do what? Yeah, um, most people say I want to be a writer, right? Like that's what exactly. they say. Right. Okay. Exactly. So, um, so when I went to college, okay, it's kind of I'm gonna try to make this short. When I went to college, I had the choice. I, well, I was choosing, do I want to major in writing? Because I went to a small liberal arts college where like journalism wasn't the major, it was just writing. Or mm -hmm. did I want to go into music education? Because I had played the piano for ten, over 10 years. I was in choir. I knew music theory, blah, 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 right? So they said, well, to graduate with a degree in music education, like you have to give a recital. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? 
you have to do do huh and they were like yeah you have to give like a recital like if you're gonna sing you're saying if you're gonna play the piano you gotta play the piano i was like okay for a i have never sung a solo in my life i always sing as part of a choir or a small group right number two mm-hmm. these are small hands i cannot physically stretch some of the octaves that are necessary right which is where the music theory comes in because then you can kind of rewrite it um without compromising the artist's work but anywho i was like what do you have to do for a writing major and they were like oh it's just a project like between you and your advisor i was like writing it is okay (laughs) (laughs) Okay. and uh i dreamed of working in the news i wanted to be a syndicated columnist for the chicago tribune that's what i wanted um it didn't quite work out that way clearly um but I did, I have been, worked in competitive news markets now for over 20 years. Wait, how old am I? Oh, over, yeah, wow, okay, yeah. <laughs> like, like 25 years, wow, crap. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, so I think my love of reading, plus being a reporter, right, which makes me ask questions, I'm curious, makes, so reading, I know grammar, I know sentence structure, you know, that's been my whole life. I've made a career out of writing in news markets. I've been a content marketer. I've worked in PR sometimes all at the same time, depending on what my day job was and what my freelance gig was. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But then in the, so I was working um, in the marketing department of a law firm and uh, during the lockdown and it was not great for my mental health. I had a lot of personal joy, but I needed some professional joy. Um, and so I find like, uh, a couple people finally were just like, look, are you going to do this or are you not going to do it? Right? Like, come on. And so I said, all right, well, fine. And I started the business and my friend, Sarah from college was like, so you're going to get paid to do what you do for us for free. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Very nice. So I mean, you, you've been editing your friends and family's documents all this time. Yeah. Yeah. Like Sarah, my friend, I just mentioned, um, I edited her master's thesis. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And every, she had this one paragraph, every single sentence started with the, and so I put a note in the margin. I was like, the editor is distracted by all the sentences in the paragraph that begin with the, <laughs> you know, it's like, what's happening here? <laughs> exactly. That's needed. That's so necessary. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I used to, I've edited my kids' papers when they were in school. I edited, I wrote and edited papers for people in college, but that's just between us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Understood about that. So, with, so I would love to know, so you make the decision to do editing. You leave mm-hmm. the, the law practice you were a part of. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you get your first client? So I was very lucky um, at the same time that I was forming the business, I belonged to a group run by Malika Holloway called mm-hmm. Social Proof Success, right? My friend, Allison, I edited her, her book was like the first real book I edited. It's called The Other Side of Adorable. It's about how to parent grown kids, <laughs> which Ooh, is- a That's a great thing. title, by the way, The Other Side of Adorable. That was her blog. Like she had a blog. And we turned it into a book. It, it's amazing. Um, I have a lot of text messages to send people like, now that you're on the other side of the door. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So, you know, so she, so anyway, um, so they brought me into the TSP world. They were like, you should join TSP. You know, this is really great. And through TSP, I met Tamara Mitchell Davis. And in the fall of 2020, she asked me to be part of her online uh, conference. And that's when I gave my first presentation about why editing is so important. And then she and I started working together. We're on book five. I'm currently editing book five for her. Um, And honestly, uh, TSP is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, So is, and and Crystal Swain Bates, who is also in the TSP family, she has the Six Figure Self-Publishing Group, which, you know, I'm a part of that. And then um, it's just, it's referrals. Right. So, so those two um, groups and then Malika's group too, uh, which has since transitioned to something else has also been priceless. Um, And so it it has all been through referral, which I know is a gift. It's uh, no, that is, that is a gift. Um, 
in any business, in any mm -hmm. business, I've had a slew of businesses since I was 22. I mean, my very first one was selling candy at nine, um, literally selling candy at nine and not like do a front separate race. from like a school fundraiser. fundraiser. Cause like we had separate to do that. From, no, I literally was sitting in church, sitting in church and I was in children's church, which literally meant that there was um, a portion of the sanctuary that was glassed off. Okay. I mentioned that was soundproof glass. Okay. And all the kids sat back there. And so. I like the um, soundproof glass. That is genius. <laughs> it was genius. This is the 80. This is the 80. So soundproof glass. And I'm looking around and I just see everybody asking each other for candy. Okay. Like, okay. But then it's like nobody has candy. But five to 10 minutes before offering time, the glass, got money. the glass comes open because uh, the parents are, you know, motioning to their children, come here so that I can put a quarter in your hand, a dollar in your hand, to you're not going to embarrass me by not going to the offering plate and not right. having anything. Right. Now I'm like, wait a minute. There's money in the room, but there's no candy in the room. And this is my nine-year-old self. I'm like, well, this is... <laughs> I don't understand if the money's up there and they're back here, but they just went and I got it. Why can't they have candy? So literally that night, and I say, this is my first angel investor or my first pitch. This is my first, first angel pitch. investor. My mother was my first angel investor. And I, okay. and I this is my very first pitch. Okay. <laughs> We're in the car. We're in the car heading home from church. And I said, so mom, she said, what? I was like, can we go to Crest? Crest is a chain of grocery stores here in Oklahoma City. Okay. She's like, I said, can I go to, can we go to Crest? She said, what do you want to go to Crest for? I said, I want to buy candy. She said, why do you want to buy candy? So I told her, she said, okay, what you going to do with it? I'm like, I'm selling. She said, you are? She said, well, how are you going to do it? I said, I guess we need to get some candy and just put it in a bag. And then I'll take, <laughs> take it to church. <laughs> and I'll take it on Sunday. And she's like, okay. I said, but I don't have any money. She said, well, I'm going to give you some money. You got to pay me back. I said, well, how much money are you going to give me? She said, I'll give you $10. So with that, with that $10. That's like a million dollars to a nine-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh but luckily, she was also my CFO. So <laughs> she went to the grocery store with me mm -hmm. to ensure that while we were there, I did not, you know, overspend. I stayed within yep. the parameters of the budget. We bought a, a cause Ziploc storage bags just came out. So um, a lot of Ziploc, well, uh, Ziploc storage bags. So I had a, like a gallon bag, mm -hmm. bought all this cheap candy, put that in the bag. And now I was ready to go to church. Sold out my very first Sunday there. I felt amazing. I felt like I had walked the stage of a six figure or seven figure award. You couldn't tell me shit. I was the <laughs> dopest nine year old and I was the dopest nine year old you ever seen. Hell yeah, um, you were. <laughs> like, he got, like, he got money. <laughs> like, it was a thing. Um, and then I, the little, then I thought the little girl was cute. And she was like, oh, so you sell candy. And then she stole all my candy. Mwah, mwah. And my money. Oh, that's worse. So that was the first and last partnership I've ever had. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. Yes. First yes. And last. So with that story reminds me of is the just the ability to persevere I didn't have any perseverance of course at nine um I, not at that time and perseverance for me came around when I was like 13 when I had lawn care service but what has perseverance looked like for you in the editing world because sometimes we think that well there's authors everywhere and there's books being written every day so an editor wouldn't have any problems well you're not wrong there are books being written every day um so perseverance it it first of all it takes stamina to write a book right it takes a certain amount of stamina hey, that it takes stamina to write a book <laughs> um but it also takes stamina to edit one right so and I don't know if it's person. I mean, there are droughts just like there are with any business, right? Like 
it just happens. It's the, it, and it's not um, seasonal. It's not like, you know, Black Friday seasonal kind of stuff, right? It's just depends. Um, but that's when you have to, uh, you know, create more content, invite more people into your world, make work your connections, you know, put, ask the question out there. Is anybody writing a book? How can I help? You know, so it is really about that. And I do, um, books are really, really important um, for a number of reasons. And I had a conversation with someone um, in Atlanta last month um, at the mastermind event that we were at. And uh, they asked me, you know, because chat GPT and AI is a big thing. And they said, um, how do you feel about AI writing a children's book? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the reason why, and I use AI, like I use AI to create content because that saves time. I have 50, 11 nice. emails I have to create for workflows that I have somebody putting together for me. Am I going to write all those? No, no sir, I am not. Um, <laughs> I will shape them up to make sure they sound like me and they're, you know, sound, but I'm not writing all of them. Um, but the reason why I say no uh, for books is because children's books are often, almost always, a child's first window into the world outside of their immediate family and outside of their home. And I feel like because they they are often, I mean, kids have imagination, right? You'll see a one and a half year old playing whatever. But if that one and a half year old has been read to from the time they came home from the hospital or from the, the day they were adopted into their family or whatever, um, their imaginations are a little different. They're a lot different and their vocabulary is just crazy by the time they go to kindergarten. So that's another reason why books are so important, but I feel like children's books are so special. It is often a bonding time between a child and their adult, whoever, if it's their parent, their older sibling, their grandparent, aunts, uncles, doesn't matter. It's a bonding time. Um, often the best stories come from our own experiences or books that we loved as a child, or maybe stories our family told us, um, you know, uh, I just feel like they're, they serve such an important purpose that I, I, I don't think AI is appropriate for that. Plus, and I'm just going to say this for everybody out there who thinks all the AI is like the bee's knees and the cat's meow and other animal things, right? <laughs> um, it is to a certain degree. AI is not a tool for non-writers because if you don't know who your audience is and you don't have clear messaging to begin with, your AI produced content is going to suck no matter what. So, 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 we, so taking that, <laughs> because I'm, I'm not done, I, want, I don't want you to stop talking just yet, but I need to hammer that point home. Okay. Like, I just want to make sure that the person that's co-creating this episode with us right now <laughs> want you to hear this. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with AI. There's nothing, There's nothing wrong, wrong with, with AI. AI. Like with things like chat GPT. However, to think that you're just going to allow chat GPT and other AI tools to just write endlessly things for you without your, uh, without your massage. It's your special sauce. Your yeah, without special your sauce. your input. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, that's, that would not be accurate. Right. Yeah. Right. And actually, um, Ashley Stewart posted on Facebook earlier today. She was like, um, they don't use any AI to create posts for their clients because she said, and I quote, it's giving fraud. Mm. And, and here's why I know why she said that. Number one, um, chat GPT is, is only, can only scrape the information it's been fed. Right. And so if every, or not everybody, but you know, if, if thousands of people are scraping the same information, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to be yours, right? Asa has a certain way of talking. Heather has a certain way of talking. Ashley has a certain way of talking, right? So while I don't, I, I don't necessarily agree with her wholeheartedly, 
I, what I do agree with is the fact that you can't just have your AI like verbally vomit all this stuff and then you just copy and paste and put it out in the world. Like that's not okay. And that again is another reason why you shouldn't use AI to write books, especially children's books. And if you're writing a book about your own story. Most definitely. Now I would probably, I would say that if you are someone like Barack Obama, you are someone like Cher, you are someone like Tina Turner. Yes, and a, an AI could probably write a book about their lives. Um, now, it's not gonna be completely accurate, but they're gonna scrape the internet and they're gonna write it. And mm -hmm. it'll have some readability to it, but it, it's definitely not gonna be as enjoyable mm -hmm. as if a human or to do it. And so we have to think about that. Think about your own Google ability. I have no idea if that's the word or not, but think about yeah, I know that. Actually, my favorite phrase is let's give it a Goog. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> there. I'm adding that to my lexicon. So you, you don't, if, if your Google ability, when you Google yourself mm -hmm. and you don't come up even on the first page of Google, um, I don't think it's probably a good idea to lean too heavily on an AI platform at all, if not ever. Uh, now, of course, you know, 20, 30 years from now, somebody be like, well, Asa, this did not, <laughs> this did this not- This didn't age well, uh, sir. <laughs> this did not age well at all. And that's a possibility. Well, and you there, know what though? There might be a robot offended at this right now. <laughs> well, but, but here's the thing, readability is the key. Yes. You said it, that word, it's it readability. Right. So what what does readability? There are several components of readability. Right. So does it sound like you? If I if I'm reading stuff on your website, I want to be able to hear your voice in my head. Right. Right. And that's for the people who know you. Obviously, people who don't know you are it's going to be a little bit different, but you have enough material out there where people could see and hear you and understand your voice. Right. So anything they read should sound like you. Anybody, anybody who knows me can read something I wrote. They know it's me, right? They mm -hmm. know that I wrote it. But there's also, there's also a component of delivering on your brand promise to your customers. Okay, so let's just go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies, gentlemen, humans of the world, we are about to get into the brand promise. <laughs> uh, accountability has now arrived. Yes. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, so your your brand promise is unique to whatever positioning you have in your market and in your industry, right? But if you're promising whatever you're promising, your your customer journey from start to finish has to be a hundred percent authentic and a hundred percent uh I want to see now I'm lost for words, work with words. Uh, like it has to be uh, smooth, right? There yes. can't be any broken pieces because broken pieces is where customer issues come up, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever your customer journey is, as short or long as it is, however many steps, it has to be authentic. So they have to know, like, and trust you. But here's the thing. people don't do business with brands. I saw that I put this meme actually on, I, I have to find it, but anyway, um, people don't do business with brands. They join brands, right? So that's about community. Okay, stop. You're not going to say that and just skate over it. The hell <laughs> say that again, please. So people don't, don't, dang it. Now you just got me. <laughs> People don't they something do. brands, they join brands. I can't remember now. People it's just that fast. Support right. brands, they join them. No, it's not, it's not about support because if they become part of your community, they're supporting you, right? Sure, it's, it's, oh, they don't, um, they don't support brands. They join brands, right? They join them, right? It becomes a community. You build, you, you build that, um, uh, that customer loyalty, customer retention, you know, all that stuff. Right. So, if you're if you're if you are overtly relying on AI to produce your content, you are not delivering on your brand promise, and you are not encouraging your customers to be part of your community. 
So we're not done with the conversation at all. But I have to <laughs> say, I was not prepared. I was prepared for you, yes. I was not prepared. I wasn't really thought we'd go here either. So here we are. But I just wasn't prepared. That, and I, I've worked with editors. I worked with editors for uh, small pieces of content and all the way to the books that I've done. And I must say, I have never considered, number one, that my editor was supporting me with my brand reputation. Yes. And I was not considering that my editor was supporting me to make sure that I was on point with my brand promise. Yes. I just, those were two deliverables that I had not considered. Yeah, you know, and another thing, and the reason why editing is so important is because you can't edit your own work. That's not called editing. That's just rewriting. That yeah. there's no such thing as editing your own work. Now, what I will say is, should you give yourself time and space, like for your book, right? You're going to write your book, and I'm going to tell you to walk away from it for two weeks and don't look at it. And then when you come back to it, I want you to read it out loud in its entirety, because that's when you will catch phrasing that's off. That's when you'll catch your subject verb agreement might not be on point, right? Those are, those are things that you're going to catch. And then you're going to give it to me and I'm going to do the whole developmental edit. But we always see what we meant to say and not what's actually on the page, which is why your editor is the, or you need an editor because we're objective. We have no emotional ties to your work. We have an arm's length view. We're, we're completely objective. We just want to make sure that whoever ends up with your book in their hands gets your entire message. They've gone on the journey you intend them to take, and they end up at the end of your book, either feeling a certain way, thinking about things in a different way, or taking an action you want them to take. That's the whole point. That is the point. So, the point. and that, and that is for all your content, actually. Mm -hmm. So whatever content you're producing, like I, I, I ask all the time, like, can you look that post over? Cause you know, I'm just typing on my phone or on, you know, whatever I'm giving a presentation next week at a conference in Puerto Rico. I will, I sent it to, you know, obviously you have to send it to the event person, but Tam Tamara Mitchell Davis is the organizer. Um, it's her conference. And she will look it over and let me know if I made mistakes, right? So let's, I need so that. I like to talk about that too. So yes, I know that you are an editor of books. Yes, you've done great. Um, editor of documents, press releases, and things of that nature. Let's kind of talk about, let's bring it even some steps closer to ourselves and talk about editing posts. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, first of all, here's the thing. When you own a business, and for people who are like, I don't own a business, I work at a company. I, all I did was write a book. You're a business owner. You wrote a book, that's your business. Because 20% of the 100% effort was writing your book. 80% is marketing and selling. So now you have a business. So you are the face of your brand. You are. Every, every individual, Asa, Heather, Ashley, Tamara, we're all the faces of our business, right? That includes every word that you put into the public. Every written word that you put into the public. Would you even go as far as to say every sentence, every paragraph is a brand representation? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I hadn't considered that. Yep. Yeah, you well, are. Now, your of course, now that you say it, it's like, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this, right, but it's one of those things, right? I, I, I hear, I'm told stuff or I listen to stuff every day where I'm like, oh my God, that makes all the sense in the world. And of course I knew that, duh, right? Yeah. But until somebody else says it, then it brings it home. It happens all the time to people. This is really good. You know, I got it. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay. If for those that you you are co-creating this episode with Heather and I, and so far with Heather and I, we you and I have found out about Heather, um, <laughs> the creator of Pins and Proof, mm -hmm. that 
she can do these things for you. She can create your brand. She can help manage the rep or save the reputation of your brand and ensure that you deliver upon your brand promise. Like that's kind of beast mode um, that one industry, one person couldn't literally do that. Like create a brand, manage the reputation of that brand and ensure the brand promise of that brand. Yeah, it's all, and it's all through editing. And, and here's the thing too, a lot of people who edit books don't also edit copy like that, but mm -hmm. I come from a content marketing world. So I worked at an e-commerce company in the kitchen and bath space, and um, I was the communications manager. So Whoa. that's what I did. I created blogs. I wrote email nurture sequences. I did social posts. I did all of that stuff. And then when we um, we, they, whatever, they're not in business anymore. Um, but th when the company decided to launch a new brand, we brought on an agency and then I was the liaison for the agency. And so then I edited all their writer stuff to oh make sure goodness. it aligned with the company. So when you talk about pins and proof, you got lots of proof. <laughs> <laughs> I got receipts. <laughs> yes, you have lots of receipts. <laughs> yeah, when you say you've been doing this for over 20 years, yeah, you been you did not just say, you know, I was good in English in high school. And then I did all this other stuff that had nothing to do. And then, you know, I was thinking, I should start editing books. <laughs> like that was not your journey at no. all. <laughs> no, no, I've been I've been writing and editing like my whole adult life. You know, I still so um I launched a news website 10 years ago with a friend of mine. Um, because you did what? Oh, you didn't know. Did I never tell you that? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Who launches the whole news website? You mean like like a BBC, like a CNN, like a yeah, public it's still, type thing? Yeah, it's called RacineCountyI.com. Yeah, RacineCountyI.com. It's still in existence. Um, so we were, have you, you heard of the Patch Network, some news, news websites? Did you ever hear of them? Yeah. Tim Armstrong started them. He was with Yahoo or something, and then he went to AOL. Anywho, it doesn't matter. There were thousands of patch websites across the country, including here in Wisconsin. And we covered, like if this is the city of Milwaukee, we covered like the half circle. So it's like for communities that didn't have a dedicated news source. Mm -hmm. And so they're very hyper-local sites. Yes. So I covered the villages of Mount Pleasant and Sturdivant in Racine County. Now, you would think that a village of 7,000 people and another village of 26,000 people wouldn't have that much news. Au contraire, mon frere. <laughs> I was busy. I worked 12-hour days. <laughs> like, okay. for reals. Um, but uh, anyway, so patch ended and we all lost our jobs on the same day, which sucked. But um, somebody in our community um got uh, Denise and I together with a lawyer, a business person, and a web designer and said, patch is ending. That is unacceptable. What are we going to do about it? And we were like, we don't know. What are you talking about? And he was like, you do know, get it together. And that's how it started. And mm. so, so yeah, so we started our news website. I got out of it in 2016. It was just too much. Um, and I wanted to be a normal person because when you're in the news, you can't really express opinions because you have to be right. biased and whatever. Right. Um, and I was kind of done with that. So, and I was tired and Denise really had a better handle on like the business side of it. And I was like, please go fly. Cause you clearly, this is like your passion and this is what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And she's still kicking ass and taking names today. And, um, and then I started working with her again. So I'm right. I'm doing some news stories again, because news is just something once you're bitten, like an mm -hmm. infection never I goes Never I goes away. <laughs> okay. I, okay, so even though I don't get the reporting side, I yeah. definitely get the, because of course the reporting side is the down and dirty of it all. What I got the bug with was when I first, when I did my very first in-studio interview at a oh. local morning news sure. show. Sure. And I was like, all oh, the lights and cameras and hey. like there was absolutely no audience no yeah, i mean it doesn't okay. matter well, you knew that they were behind the kid they were at home yeah you knew and yeah. i was like okay so i could do this every day <laughs> like this feels <laughs> this feels at home for me um so i definitely understand how that that 
biting of the bug works for sure. Yeah. The, the problem with that though, is now that I'm a business owner and I have to put myself out there, it's deeply uncomfortable because mm. I'm not used to that. Right. So wow. now I have to get out there and I have to talk about myself and then I do the service and then I can help you and I can do this. And you know, that book that you keep putting on your to-do list every year, but Oh God, now we're flipping the page to another year and your book is still not written. Like I, I have to talk about that stuff. And so for me, it's a little hard, but I'm getting better at it. You know, oh, think about it. I mean, an editor is by nature, someone who supports you in the background, because I mean, have we ever seen a celebrity editor? Not that I'm aware of. See? <laughs> but I mean, I'm not exactly the hippest on pop culture and stuff either. So I don't know that I actually. That's fine. That's you know, fine. I mean, um, Dame Judy Dench is probably not on pop culture. I saw an interview with her. She didn't know who some people that were very obvious were, but she's still Dame Judy Dench. She, she is that. She Dame. is that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything. She's a whole celebrity. So, you're right, though. And I actually. So when I talked earlier about being of service, like for me, it is my greatest joy to watch you succeed with your book. Like, I love that. I don't need the spotlight. I'll stand behind the curtain and I'll like throw you props and feed you lines if you need them. Right. But right. you can be on stage in the spotlight. I don't need that. I, I want to be the person who's supporting you, who is making sure that you get this thing done, that you can close more sales, get on more stages, you know, increase your brand authority, get your subject matter expertise out there and, and be the person who is helping other people transform their lives based on what you know and you've experienced. Indeed. And so, right? so that whole joy that you're talking about, you, that's your joy. And mm -hmm. for you money cousins out there that are saying, you know, I haven't finished my book. I haven't even started the book that I would love to create. But, and that would be my joy. Heather is literally here saying her joy is to support you and you creating your joy. So yes. align your damn joy. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, just do the joyful thing. Yeah, you know, and a lot of people too, like, I think writing, a lot of people don't start their books because, as you know, writing is a very solitary activity because you're in your Ooh. head, right? You're not talking and to all, anybody. And all you want to do the whole time is talk to somebody else. And talk to somebody. <laughs> you want to be able to be like, oh my God, can I run this by you, right? Yeah. Like, that's what it is. And so, you know, that is that is a hard hurdle to clear if you don't have a community where you can do that, you know? And so, um, can I, I don't know, can I say my thing on Monday? Can I, I don't know. Can you say your thing on Monday? Yeah. Like, can I talk about it? I just don't, it's your podcast. I don't want to. What's happening Monday? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, I'm inviting people. Like, I'm having a, a webinar. Oh, most, oh my goodness. Really? Really, really, like really right now? <laughs> <laughs> Please tell the people what's happening one day. Okay. Um, on Monday at 7 p.m., uh, I am hosting a webinar. It's free. And we're going to talk about writing a message that sells. And what we're going to talk about especially is um, TSI. And that stands for time, space, and instrument. And a lot of people think instrument is just your computer, right? But it's not. You should always have a pen and a paper. Take down notes when things come to you. Don't use your phone. Don't use your notes in your phone because, you know, they'll get lost. You'll never find them again. Always have like a pen and a paper with you because there is a physical connection between what you put on the page and what's in your head. It's a memory connection. It creates new pathways just like a memory would. Um, there's tons of studies that show that writing for 15 minutes a day with a pen and paper, pen to paper is physically good for you. There have been instances where people with like asthma have had their symptoms reduced. People with pain, chronic pain have, that's reduced. People who report traumas, traumas and things that they're going through, those things get reduced because of writing. So it's good for you. So, so when we talk about time, space and instrument, instrument is also community. 
And so what I want to create is that community. I want to create that community. So I'm inviting everybody to come to the webinar on Monday. Um, I will put it on the Facebook Monday, 17th, 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 17th. Wait, 14, 15, 16, 17, yeah, April. yeah, okay. April 17th, 7 p.m. Central. I will put it on the Pens and Proof um, Facebook page, so please visit there and then register. And I hope I see you because I know you have questions and I can help answer them. Now, for those money cousins that are hearing this after April 17th, will there be a replay available or maybe even a encore event or yeah. are you doing it again? Yep, I'll do it the next week. I'll do it on the 17th and the, was that the 24th? It is the 24th. Yes, um, 17th okay. and 24th. So I'll do it again awesome. on the 24th at 7 p.m. also, because, um, you know, I'm going to Puerto Rico next week, so. You are. Yes, you are. Now, that sounds exciting. I'm very excited. <laughs> well, let's just be clear. I want to go to Puerto Rico, but I need to renew my passport because that thing just laughs like laughs. Puerto Rico is the U.S. territory, sir. You do not true. need to I mean, true. To go there. But I mean, it's still, though, I, my stuff will act. Like, how? Uh, I've been so good. I've been so good for a decade, and here I am letting like, it okay. last. Well, I, I cast no shade your direction because mine expired in 2018 and I just renewed it. How long did it take now? Uh, I think mine took about six weeks. Okay, that's average. No, I didn't think it was that bad. No, it's not. No. Uh, I I, go, I've heard if I actually just go to Houston um, and like do a whole appointment, it could even be quicker than that. Really? I was told, I, I was told that, that you actually have some type of appointment or there's some type of expedited, expedited way. Okay. You can have to look more into it, but yeah. that's not the I, there. I mean, I live in Milwaukee, so you know, it's not happening here. <laughs> but, <laughs> <understood>. <laughs> but I can easily make that drive or that trip down to Houston for sure. So yeah. the event's taking place April 17th. And then again, the following week, yes. going over TSI time, space, and instrument. Mm -hmm. for the writing process so you all money cousins if you if you're ready and if you feel like you're almost kind of not ready still attend get something out of it so that when it's time to do it you have more tools and resources for when you are ready so yeah and we're, and we're going to talk about writing a message that sells too because the whole point of you writing a book is i mean yeah some people just want to be like i published a book right but that is not the case with most people like there's an investment, even with self-publishing, that's still an eight to $10,000 investment, right? Yeah. Again, editing the most important and the most expensive piece of that. Just going to put that in there because that is facts. It's facts. Um, yeah. But so you need to, you, you need to get a return on your investment and then make money also, right? So your message has to sell, but how do you put that together? Mm -hmm. Accurate. Yeah. Exactly. So today has been really good when it comes to me understanding more things about the editor space you uh with pens and proof being able to support authors to support writers support content creators in that way by again creating that brand making sure that that brand's reputation is intact and that brand promise is on the level in which we all would love it to be which is good. Like we don't want our customers to feel like our brand promise was taken advantage of or broken or anything. Or not even communicated clearly. Or not communicated. You know, yeah. and it's not even just AI create, created content. A lot of people have VAs that are overseas. English is not their first language, but they're mm -hmm. creating content. And then there's also um, PLR, uh, private label content, right? That yes. also needs to be shaved up so that it sounds like you, because otherwise, if you don't and you just put it out there, you're going to sound like the 10,000 other people who purchased the same thing, which right by on. the way, let's not forget who runs the world, Google. <laughs> if your, so if your content is exactly like everybody else's, they are not going to be happy about that. No, right? like it does that. need to have a certain amount of uh, uniqueness. It needs to be unique to you. And that doesn't actually take that much. It just takes time. And for people who are busy, do they have time to do that? They don't. No. So. And that's what you need to enter. Yeah, that part. Exactly. So <laughs> Heather, beside the event on Monday, 
how else can they reach out to you to get things going by uh, working with pins and proof? So um, you can go to pensandproof.com and there is a button to schedule a complimentary consultation. Uh, it's, it's 30 minutes. And what we'll do is we'll talk about your projects and make sure that we're a good fit um, because, uh, you know, that's important. I, you want to work with people who are a good fit for you. I want to work with people who are a good fit for me. Um, and make sure that we get along and we can make this collaboration a true partnership. Um, so you can do that. You can reach out to me on Instagram. That's pens and proof. Facebook pens and proof. I mean, I mean, on TikTok, even though I spend more time making TikToks for my cat, but that's okay. And I'm not that crazy cat lady. So don't like TikTok. <laughs> I only have one. I have one. <laughs> yeah. You're not a crazy cat lady. If you just have one, not, not. Yeah. now <laughs> you're knocking on the door. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's, I mean, that's not ever. No. Yeah, that's that's too much for me <laughs> i'm like i'm out so yeah. but thank you thank you for coming on thank, thank you. you for spending time like really letting us know what it means to be in this in this editing industry um serving people in a very iconic way um and definitely inviting our fellow money cousins to be supported in this way because and I, I say this often, yes, you can be a best-selling author, but I would love for you to be more focused on being a well-written author. And you can be both. You can be both. You can be I both. Don't, I don't like it when people are best-sellers and I'm like, ooh, because the thing about best-selling, they bought it before they read it. And now you got the gotcha and that doesn't feel wonderful to have the gotcha. you like, no. oh my goodness, because I and have family, and it, I have family goes- to do that. It goes back to making sure that you are producing the very best product for your consumer. Yes. You expect the best for your money and the person who ends up with your book in their hands expects the same. Facts, all the facts. So money cousins, go register, go register right now. That information is in the show notes. Uh, please connect with Heather on all social that she mentioned. Those please. are also in the show notes. So don't feel like if you miss something, don't feel like, oh, well, it's over. No, simply go to the show notes, re- show notes regardless. Am I saying show notes? You I'm did a couple of times, but I wasn't going to point I it did. <laughs> But you know, it's one of the things like you say it enough times fast, right? It's just all going to blur. Right. So let's, let's say this correctly. In <laughs> the show notes. <laughs> Please go to the I'm show sorry. notes. Just... <laughs> Please go there to engage with Heather so that her joy and your joy can be connected in a very joyous way. And as always, I am Asa Laveau, dreams and radical blessings.